Hi everyone, we are here to talk about uh, four tips that you can use to measure customer experience and improve it, which I'll share with you using real product examples. And this talk is for anyone interested in picking up new skills as a product manager or product management aspirants, I think you'll learn best practices that you can use in your interviews. Also, don't worry about taking screenshots or writing notes. Just scan the QR code. You'll get the slides and follow-up content related to this that you can use in your work. What can you take away today? Four things. First, uh, and, and these four things are spread across the product lifecycle. So that, let's start with figuring out what that there is a problem understanding customer behavior. So I'll talk about how you can merge product analytics, surveys, and customer interviews to have a good understanding of the why and the what of customer problems that you're sort of trying to solve. So merging data and anecdotes. Second one is trying, once you know there's a problem to solve, how do you figure out as you move towards it, whether you're solving the problem or not. So we'll talk about merging metrics and signals. Uh, so apart from using output metrics like revenue or NPS, how you can use input metrics and intermediate signals to get leading measures of customer success. Third, we'll talk about how what to do to solve a customer problem. It need not be building a feature uh, and it could also be changing processes. So you could eliminate bottlenecks in customer experience even by changing processes and hence improve the customer experience. And lastly, we'll talk about no matter what part you chose, whether it's a process improvement, a product feature development, how to make your launch a success uh, using an information checklist. Uh, before we dive into it, some context on where the content comes from and where I come from. Uh, I run Spark Creative Technologies, where I provide product coaching and business consulting services. Um, before this, I was uh, a staff product manager at Twilio. And some of my foundational experiences have been around uh, figuring out different ways of measuring and improving customer experience. And so that's where majority of the content comes from for today's talk. If you have any questions, as I said earlier, you can either scan the QR code or you can go to harshalp.com slash talk and you'll get the follow-up information. Let's start with the first example. Uh, this was a time in when I was building with my team a KYC registration funnel for our customers. Um, and when I looked at the product analytics, so that's the first part of the data, and I looked at our product analytics, I saw mostly normal behavior that there are customers, few customers dropping off at each step through the, uh, through the KYC funnel. But what was surprising was at one stage midway, we saw 60% customers dropping off. Why was this surprising? Because this step was really simple. It just asked customers to wait for verification and then told, congratulations, you have been verified. Uh, why would customers drop off in such a step? So to understand that more, I tried to understand from three angles. I already talked about how product anal analytics gave me an idea that this is an important problem to solve. So next I looked at qualitative data, things like survey responses from customers or customer support requests, which gave me some idea of what customers are looking for or what customers are thinking about. And to understand that more, I reached out to a few of such customers to interview them and build a lot more empathy and get in their shoes. And what did all of this tell me is that customers thought that this step uh, is just seemed so easy that it probably means this is the last step. So I was done as I was, you congratulated me, I think I'm done by. Some of the customers thought there is wait time are going on, so you'll probably notify me when it's done, right? So I left the page. So either way, we were seeing drop-offs, uh, and which is where we came into solving for the drop-offs. So we solved for it in two ways. Um, and th these are all these are all UI solutions that I'm talking about, UI UX solutions. There were also some product or legal solutions, we, which we'll talk about in our different uh, talk. So we solved for the wait by notifying customers after the wait time had elapsed. So instead of making them wait there, we notified them through email and notifications. And both of these were targeted to bring them back directly to that step in the funnel instead of putting them back right to the start of the funnel. The other thing we solved for is the sequence of steps that you saw there. We solved for it by 
merging the earlier part and latter parts of the funnel so that it seems more seamless. And this step has a more clear call to action that it's not congratulations, but it's proceed. That's the important part in this step. And this experience highlights or my, my learning, uh, or like I highlight my learning in a way to say that there are three ways for you to learn about your customers, which will help you mix anecdotes and data is you can start with quantitative data like product analytics or data that you have, web analytics and so on, which will help you identify usage patterns of your product or fi uh, find some patterns of problems gives you some idea of what could be some possible, re possible reasons you're building hypothesis. Next, you look at qualitative anecdotes, which are uh, which are fewer in number, but more in depth, like customer survey responses, forum posts, uh, anything that customers write about on their own reviews and so on, which helps you clarify some of the why. Then talking to customers helps you build more empathy, which, which can then help you get into their mind. How does my customer think it's not just what is the problem, but what does the customer think about the problem? This helps you then figure out the why and solve for it. Which is why I'd say by merging product analytics, surveys, and interviews is a way to understand your customers deeply. Next example I'll talk about is a time when I uh, saw that there were hundreds of support tickets to change billing settings. Um, and so when I looked at what these tickets were, it helped me understand, okay, what there is some solution I can build, but also if I were to measure the success of the solution, I would measure it by looking at the number of support requests that our customers are creating month over month or day over day. So I built and launched a self-service feature with my colleagues. And as you can see a UI uh, mock-up of it where customers could update their payment information, their address information, their purchase order number, their billing email and so on and just click save and it's done. And yet we saw that the metrics were not improving. Uh, if you see here, the, the number of tickets per month, they start, stayed pretty much flat through the month. Uh, so if the tickets are flat, but we know we have launched a feature, how do we know whether it's working or it's failing? Uh, to figure out whether it's working or failing, we can see that although the support tickets are very high, and uh, we still understand that the launch was the input metric in our hand. That was something we had complete control over. But the thing we want to eventually move, this is support tickets reduction, is that's the output metric. And we haven't able to move that yet. We also understand that there is a latency in the benefit from when we launch it. The benefit won't happen on the next day. So what are some early indicators? Let's look at some early indicators and put, plot them on a time from early to late lagging. Launch is an input indicator. That's the first thing you can control and measure whether you have launched or not. Uh, views of your any articles, blog posts that you post about it, any redirections from support to this feature instead of solving it on their own for the customer, the number of page views for your feature, how much usage is your feature creating for your services behind the scenes and so on. And eventually you would want to see a reduction in the need of your support to help customers. An example of data that I saw here is for the API hits. Uh, so although at this point in time, I couldn't see much benefit on the support tickets reduction, but I could see that the feature has resulted in our API getting used more for uh, reading details of the customers or writing details of the customers. So clearly there were some customers using it. One hypothesis at this point was that the segment of customers using the feature was different from the segments of customers who were earlier creating support tickets. So although we are helping some customers, we are not able to reach the customers who actually uh, were needed in need for this feature. Um, and the one takeaway from here about how to measure success, like we looked at the graph of API usage, is that you can track success using both output and input metrics. You can control the input metrics, such as launch of products, but you can also find signals or early indicators of progress. And uh, I have put some on the graph here with the timeline from launches to controlling the page latency using better systems to number of blogs you post about it uh, and a lot of things in between leading up to revenue or profit or the number of customers who are using your product or the feature.
And that's where I would like to summarize by saying that apart from output metrics, using input metrics and signals helps you get leading measures of customer experience to help you ensure that you're working towards the right direction. Third example I'd like to pick up here. Uh, third example is around a time when I saw 10,000 customers angry with our product. Um, I saw angry emails coming from customers that we are not responding to them, even though that was their first email to customer support. So what's the disconnect? You can see an example email here where customers emailed somebody, they didn't get any reply, and then they're emailing support and they're saying, we are not responding. So it seems like we received um, emails which followed the similar pattern where customers were replying to an email from an automated, automated inbox. Uh, that inbox was not monitored as frequently. And so this resulted in 10,000 plus customer emails which were unopened. So I, this led to a situation where customers are angry even though there are no bugs in the product. So there need not, need not be a product solution for this. So what should I do? There is a problem in the customer experience. I want my customers to have a good experience, but it's not a bug. Um, this is where I thought of having a process change with stakeholders. Let me describe the process we had so far. Our customers were expected to reach out primarily to support, customer support, and customer support when they need more help would escalate a question to an expert team. Uh, however, the emails were going out automatically from the expert team, team's inbox to customers. They would reply to it and expect the expert team to reply to their questions. This wasn't happening. What should we do? We're working with the teams. We decided it's required for us to disconnect customers from the expert team and also encourage more questions to reach the support team, which will also encourage more questions to get funneled down to the expert team. So although there is, there's a dichotomy of how come we are increasing the load on some team, disconnecting customers from some part of your organization, eventually this led, led to a better experience because we are able to provide more reliability in the number of, uh, in the time that it takes for us to respond to customers. And this is how I'd like to summarize that you can improve process, not just the product, basically figure out whatever is the bottleneck and improve on that. Oftentimes process improvements um, can also be cheaper than product launches. So that's a like more cost-effective way to improve your customer experience. Not just that, sometimes product launches itself also need process changes. And I have a few examples here of process changes that you might need to support a product launch. For example, you want to train your support team on how to redirect or how to handle new questions that will come up given a new feature or product. You want to put in new escalation policies in place. You want to have an internal roadshow where you're evangelizing or educating about your feature to customer support, customer success, sales, technical solution architects, and so on. And some more examples here on the slide for you. Which is why I'd like to summarize to say that uh, beyond product features, work on process changes to improve customer experience by eliminating bottlenecks. The fourth experience I'll share here, fourth real world example is about a time when my product launch failed. I launched a product redesign where I removed some features and I redesigned some of the, uh, most of the parts of the product. And I thought, hey, it's, it's a good product, right? We don't need any documentation. Um, why do we even need to inform support? Anyway, there won't be support tickets about it, right? It's, it's a good thing we're doing. Um, but also we were confused. Did the launch succeed? I don't know how good or bad the situation was earlier. So how do I figure out whether the situation has improved after the launch? Um, and as you can expect, there was a basic lack of uh, launch hygiene. And even at a time where the software or the product worked, um, the customers were not either aware of what I had launched or they were not aware of how to understand the new design. And so because of which there was no customer benefit. I launched something, customers are not aware of it. Customers don't use it. If customers, and so customers don't get benefit out of it, which means the launch had no benefit. The launch failed. So this is why the launch failed. And in fact, that was this was kind of the development um, pattern that I used in this product launch is that we did the development with the engineering and design team, then I launched it public as a publicly available 
uh, product claiming it to be publicly available while it had bugs and it was unreliable. And then I, my team and I scrambled to make it more dependable. This was definitely not a good way to do things. So how did I improve on this? There was another time where I got to, uh, I was aware that we need to make a disruption in the customer experience. Uh, so I, I worked hard on how do I even make a disruption a success. So when this was a time when we were removing a feature, it was a type of payment method for the customers, which would disrupt customers, ex the experience of them or their usage. So I built a checklist of what all do we need to do to reduce the impact of this for our customers. So I started with identifying who, which are the customers which will be impacted by this change. Um, and I added information at the points in the customer uh, touch points where they would care about this. So I knew that they would care about this in emails and bills and FAQs, but they did not really care about this on the web portal. I also gave advanced heads up to the go-to-market team, like for example, the sales team of very high value customers, so they can maintain that one-on-one -on -one relationship with sharing this information with them. Um, and lastly, I also worked with the support team to write an escalation policy for them and educated customer support with a bunch of potential FAQs. Over time, not only was that disruption, a the impact of that disruption a success in the sense that we, I could minimize it, but also I built a much more gradual release cycle, which you might have heard of in other forums about how I started with development and testing, then dog fooding, private alpha customers who are like customers who really care about the feature, no matter how buggy it is, public beta customers, announcing training and, and enabling support, and finally making it publicly available and dependable. Uh, and this, I would like to summarize this by saying that product launches involve lots of steps beyond just deploying code to production. But also, there are way too many steps and way too many small, small steps. So a way to make sure that you are able to complete all of them is to have a kind of checklist um, to enable you to do all of that. I break down the checklist into five steps. Identify which customers are impacted or which customers care about this new feature. Um, provide information in situ or in the place where customers will look for it. Enable go-to-market to talk about it, to sell about this new feature. Enable support to answer any questions that come out from customers. And announce this feature so that it, you have some kind of broadcast mechanism or targeted broadcast mechanism to reach customers at in multiple forums. So I've summarized that you can boost your launch success by using an information checklist. And let's summarize today's discussion. What all can you take away today? Um, and again, think of it along the product life cycle. You can start by understanding your customers by um, merging data and anecdotes, product analytics, surveys, customer interviews. Then as you try to figure out another problem, how do I know whether I'll be successful in launching this or not? You identify metrics of success, output metrics, input metrics, and signals, leading indicators. Third, as you figure out how do you solve this problem, apart from product feature launches, also look at process changes. And even if your product launches, still look at process changes, which enable your product launch to succeed. And lastly, enable your, the success of your product or process launch by a launch by having an informational checklist, which tackles everything that you want to, uh, where you, how you want to provide information to, to whom, what, where, how. That's everything for today. Thanks for attending.